You may be seated. We could say amen go home now, right? That was awesome. What a great day. Could we get the lights back here? Also, turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1. How many remember the commercial for M&M's? They melt in your hand, or yeah, they melt in your mouth, not in your hand, right? Well, today's message is an M&M message. So everybody hold out your hand because I'm going to give you some M&Ms. And here's the M&M sermon that you're going to get today. And that is marriage and money. Oh, now that's enough to step on everyone's toes, right? Yeah? But you want the good news? You only get one M&M today. It's only going to be marriage. So I'm giving you fair warning Next week, you're going to hear what Jesus says about money. If you don't want to, want to listen, here's your advanced knowledge. That's what Jesus is going to talk about next week. But today, let's look at the scriptures of truth here from Mark chapter 10. And then he, Jesus, arose from there and came to the region of Judea. Now, my friends, if you've been following along with us, you understand that we've been up in Caesarea Philippi with Jesus. That's as far north as Jesus went. That's where Peter made the great confession of faith. Then Jesus came from there back down to the Galilee. And the Bible prophesies in Isaiah chapter 50 that Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He's heading there. He told his disciples, and we're going to see, he's going to tell them many times, I must go to Jerusalem, I must be handed over, I must be crucified, and this is the part that they never heard, and I will rise again from the dead. And my friends, I'm here to declare to you a tremendous truth. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And my friends, this is the one thing that people in the world, they, they just freak out over. They don't care if Jesus is a way, a truth, a life. They just don't want him to be the only way. And Jesus clearly said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Why is that? Because my friends, only Jesus as God's son could deal with sin. And there's one thing that every single person in this room has in common. We're all sinners who can only be saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here, as Jesus is going along, he's going to tell his disciples this over and over, but he's moving on his way towards Jerusalem where all this is going to be accomplished. And so he came to the region of Judea, and it says, uh, uh, by the other side of the Jordan, and all the people gathered to, gather to him. It's very interesting. If you go to Israel today, it's exactly as it was in Jesus' day. Samaria today is the West Bank. Guess what? The tour buses don't go through the West Bank. In Jesus' day, that was Samaria. So guess what? The majority of the Jews never traveled that way. Jesus did once. He met the Samaritan woman there. But here's the deal. They would go up by the Jordan River. That's exactly how Jesus went. And he went up into the region of Judea. That is the area that is getting close now to Jerusalem. And in a, a couple of weeks, we're going to see the triumphal entry where he goes into Jerusalem. And it says, and as he was accustomed... He taught them again. Now, my friends, this is very key. And, and it's amazing what God's doing. Because at Calvary Chapel, we believe in teaching through the entirety of the Word of God. Acts 20, 27. The Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians, who he was with for three years, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God's Word. Now, my friends, before I came here, I was a pastor for nine years in Maxville, Kansas. It wasn't a Calvary chapel, although I listened to Chuck Smith. That's actually how I became a, a Calvary pastor, was listening through Chuck's Through the Bible teachings. But in those days, I wrote down all my sermons, and then I would file them away according to books of the Bible. Now, I was there for nine years 
And, and I remember, I brought those files with me, and after I started teaching through the Bible, I went back and I looked. Do you realize in nine years, entire books of the Bible I'd never taught once? Not one part of them. Entire chapters, even now the New Testament, that I'd never covered once. And here's the reality, because this is what most churches do. Most pastors, as I did, I sincerely wanted to bring the Word of God. But here's the deal. I'd pray all week long, and then I'd take six verses and make a nice three-point sermon with one main point. I mean, grammatically, they were wonderful messages. But here's the problem with that. How long would it take me to teach through the entirety of God's Word doing that? And the answer is, it would never happen. I could have stayed there the rest of my life and it would have never happened unless I taught the scriptures systematically, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. On the last Sunday of December this year, I will have been your pastor for 30 years. And in 30 years, I have taken you entirely from the book of Genesis through Revelation three complete times, and I'm on my fourth way through right now. And I want to tell you, that's what we're pouring into the heart. That's why we have a Calvary Bible Institute where we get to be at the forefront of raising up pastors. When I was in Uganda, and, and again, this is all over Africa. Marilyn and I run into it in Malawi all the time. There's lots of pastors who sincerely have a love for the Lord. They have no training whatsoever, and all they know what to do is what the American television evangelists are doing because they get it on TV over there. So you can imagine how terrible their theology is. And like when I was in Uganda, I'm teaching 500 pastors. And I want to tell you, they were sitting on their edge of their seat as all of us pastors who are over there are taking them through Isaiah 58, Isaiah 59, Isaiah 60, 61, Revelation 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, on to the end of the book of Revelation. As we're showing them and giving them examples of teaching through the Word, you can see the lights coming on and they're so excited and I just talked to Wes yesterday Wes Bentley and he said the pastors are so excited and then imagine how that goes out 500 pastors now doing that for all the churches that are being strengthened there and again my friends I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt that as I've been a pastor for 40 years Part of the days of the, my life that I'm in now is not only raising up young people here, which we're doing, and it's an awesome job, and uh, they, we got great, great young people who are being raised up, but part of it is that I'm not supposed to go to the grave with 40 years of pastor experience. I'm supposed to pour this into young people around the world at various times. Now, you're not getting rid of me completely, all right? I'll still be here, but... You're, I may be here, be here a little bit less. Some of you are very happy about that, that you're asking for my schedule now. But here's the deal. We all get to be a part of this. It is the very high commission that Jesus laid out. Do you realize that? He gave us a command, and this is why there's a church, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, as he comes to Judea, the Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? Now, first off, I want to tell you, the Pharisees had no interest in the truth whatsoever. The Pharisees only want to impale Jesus on the horns of dilemma. And I think they may have even had a darker, more sinister side to this question because this is exactly the same place where John the Baptist confronted Herod who was married to his brother's wife and divorced his wife so he could marry. We all know what Herod did to him. So I, I'm kind of thinking the Pharisees were kind of hoping we'll get Jesus entrapped in all of this and maybe he'll say the same thing about Herod that John the Baptist did and Herod will cut off his head so we don't have to. But my friends, I want to tell you in Jesus' day, divorce was a hot topic button. It's kind of that way today, isn't it? A hot topic button. 
And they wanted to impale Jesus on the horns of dilemma, pitting him against the Bible. Now I'm going to read through the rest of what Jesus says about this, and then we're going to come back and look at it more in depth. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? My friends, here's the deal. It is always important to go back to the Bible. And Jesus is going to go back to the Bible. And again, I want to remind you, the Pharisees weren't asking this out of sincerity of heart that they could have a question answered. My friends, have you ever run into those people that love to argue? It's very interesting I'll give you one of the biggest arguments in churches that there is. Between Calvinism, which uh, looks to the sovereignty of God, and Arminianism, which looks to the free will of man. Do you realize there are entire Bible colleges, entire people have spent all their life arguing about this question? I've actually gone to crusades where ultra-Calvinists are with signs holding up saying no choice, and they actually try to stop people from asking Jesus into their heart. Can you imagine such a thing? And my friends, I am going to solve that question for you. Here, is God sovereign? Does God know all things? And the answer is yes. yes. Is there a free will of man? And the answer is So, question solved. We'll not argue about that again, all right? But here's the deal. These people, they want to argue and spend the rest of their life arguing. When I met these people, they have no concern about winning the lost. All they're trying to do is convince you that they're right and you're wrong. It's a waste of time. I don't have time for them. I want to be out there sharing the gospel and seeing the lost saved. Hallelujah. That's what's going to change this world. So, it's a test. And let's see what Jesus does. He goes back to the Bible What does Moses command to you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote to you this precept. So first of all, let's get one thing straight. Divorce is sin. God hates divorce. The Bible clearly says that, all right? But I want to ask you a question. Is divorce the unpardonable sin? Does it mean that if you got divorced that you could never be forgiven? Jesus is going to go on and talk about uh, getting married or getting divorced not on the basis of adultery. But again, I want you to understand Jesus is dealing with the entire question here by the hardness of heart. Every sin is a divorce, okay? But is it the unforgivable sin? Does that mean that you can never get remarried again? Because that question comes up all the time. And the answer is no, because in exactly the same context, Jesus in the other Gospels, and it's all in the same context as where we were last week, Jesus would say this, if your right hand offends you, what did he say? Cut it off. If your right foot offends you, Cut it off. Your right eye, cut, uh, gouge it out. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't saying that, that this literally you need to do that. Otherwise, nobody in this room would have a right hand. You'd all be sinning with your left one anyway, okay? What he's talking about is amputating sin out of your life. And here's what we're going to see because we're going to go from divorce to children. Why is that? Because, my friends, who are the real victims of divorce? The real victims are are children. And so he's going to deal with divorce in a very strong way because there are people who think, I'll just get a divorce. God will forgive me. I'm in love with that woman over there. You know, everything's going to be just right and I can skip on in my life. And, my friends, that's not right either. So Jesus is dealing with it in the basis that is the reality of the truth of the Word of God. And let's get one thing straight. In the Old Testament, what was the punishment for adultery? Was it divorce? That stoning was the punishment. And here's how they did it. You know, 
I always, when I was younger and read about stoning, you know, I kind of thought they took big rocks to stone you. And I, I'm sure somewhere they did that. But I actually watched a documentary on stoning where they exactly described how they do this. They bury a person up to the waist. They use little rocks to pelt them to death. If you're going to stone me, please use big rocks, okay? Be fast about it. And they pelt them to death. And then there was a tradition that where that took place, they'd build a box around it, fill it with manure, and plant a tree. Thus, if you went into a town with lots of trees, it was a shady place. You're groaning. Now, I, I got to tell you something. You need to know something about me. I don't care whether you like my jokes or not. I do. And I'm fully able to entertain myself with my own jokes. So don't think your groans are going to stop me from repeating my jokes, because they're not, all right? So from the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted divorce. Now let's read on. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. My friends, whoever thought that would be an issue? Whoever thought that male and female would be an issue? Pretty, pretty, pretty simple. You know, I went to Chick-fil-A last night. I love Chick-fil-A. You, we stopped at Chick-fil-A. The drive-in was lined up like 20 cars. We go in the restaurant, 40 people are in front of us at Chick-fil-A. It's absolute, because the food is awesome and they're a wonderful Christian family-owned business that's closed on Sunday. Hallelujah. And even Kanye West sang about him, my Chick-fil-A. How funny is that? But anyway, on his Christian album that just came out, which happens to be the number one album in the, in the, in the country at this time, that's awesome too. So here's the deal. Male and female, God created them. And you know what the Bible says? Women are created in the image of God. Men are created in the image of God. Hot tip for you. Men and women aren't the same. They're not the same on the outside. They're not the same on the inside, right? There's a, there's a big difference. And I want to tell you, there are characteristics of God that only a woman has. There are characteristics of God that only a man has. And so when you look at it, and again, my friends, this is a rocket science. It's pretty simple. God made men and women different. They come together very naturally, don't they? It's just the way that it is. Every chrome in our zone in our body is different. That's, that's scientific fact. So in the beginning, God created a man and woman. And my friends, here's the deal. Since God is the creator, it's his institution of marriage. Guess what? He gets to make the rules. I don't get to make the rules. God makes the rules. It's my job to obey the rules. It's very simple. Did you guys all know you're not God? This couple got divorced, and the wife put on their religious differences. And she went on to explain, he thinks he's God, and I don't. So, <laughs> none of us are God, all right? Now, the scripture goes on to say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one. And my friends, here's the deal. God is the one that created marriage. He is the one that created Adam and Eve. And it's very interesting. The first thing that the Bible says is not good, it's not good for man to be alone. It's a natural thing. But my friends, I want to tell you, there is a gift of celibacy. God does give that gift of celibacy to people. I've known people that way. And, and my friends, and they use it like the Apostle Paul did and talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But in this, we have to understand 
None of this was man's idea. God created a woman. Now, God went to Adam, and he said, I am going to create the most beautiful creature you've ever seen. She is going to meet your every need and your every fantasy. And God said, and, and, and Adam says, well, how much does this cost me? And God said, well, it'll cost you seven ribs. And he said, well, what can I get for one rib? <laughs> you know, sometimes it's good to have a metal pulpit that's bulletproof, you know. God's institution of marriage. And when he built the woman, he brought the woman to the man. Do you realize that's where we get in our marriage ceremony? Who brings the bride down? The father of the bride. And so as he brings the, fa- uh, the, the bride down, that is a picture. It's a symbolic of God the father bringing the bride to Adam. A- and Adam... We have to realize God built the woman. And when Adam saw the woman that God built, he went, whoa, man. (laughs) And thus, well, that's true, right? Read Genesis. Do you want me to read it to you? And thus, a man shall leave his father and mother. My friends, we're going to see in this portion of Scripture the four musts of marriage. And the first one is a man shall leave his father and mother. When young people get married, my friends, it's important that we as the parents cut the apron strings. That we as the parents aren't trying to manipulate the situation or getting too involved in their lives and their situation. Now, I had a classic way of learning that, and that was my daughter Lydia. And you can ask Lydia about this. Lydia had an arranged marriage. I looked at our Bible college class. I picked the best one, and I said, that's who she's marrying, and you can ask her today. I had an arranged marriage, but hey, I did a good job. They've been married 20 years. Thank you, Chris Fagno. But in the early days, Lydia and her mother, best friends. So every little fight that Chris and Lydia had, Lydia would tell Cindy. Cindy would tell me. Now, fortunately, I was Chris's boss. I could make his life miserable very quickly. But we realized something. We can't do that. You know, you, you can't involve us in those things just like we had to work out our lives you've got to work out your own life and we need to stay out of it and because we made that decision so parents when your children get married give them the space to work out their own problems and difficulties just like you had to do in working out your own problems and difficulties because here again there's got to be a severance that relationship has to be the most important. And then it says, he shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. My friends, that's a permanence. Here's something else in our marriage. Every commitment and vow before God is going to be tested, right? I don't care what vow it is. And here's the reality When you get married, that person that you married is actually a sinner. Okay, are they going to be perfect? And we know something, love is blind, right? But one day, your eyes get opened up. And all of a sudden, you begin to look at that. And my friends, we got to make a decision in our lives when the going gets a little bit tough. And that's this, divorce isn't going to enter in. I'm not going to have that conversation. I'm not going to entertain that. I want to tell you something about me. I'm 64 years old, and in my mind, I have never lost an argument. You know why? I'm right. I'm right. Now, there is a problem, because Marilee thinks she's right. Here's the reality. Don't we all think we're right? Don't we all think we have the best idea? You know, the 
This wall ought to be brown. No, it ought to be blue. You know, it, it, and we fight over the stupidest things. And both merely and I've lived through things in our life where, let me tell you, I guarantee you, one moment could change your life where you won't fight about anything like that again. Because all of a sudden you realize you're not going to be together forever. But I want to tell you something. The unity takes place, that, or that permanence. When is a couple married? A couple is married when they say, I do. And God does. I want to ask you a question. When are you saved? You're saved when? When you ask Jesus into your heart. Are you a finished product at that point? And are you done in marriage when you say, I do? Some people get married, and what they meant was, I did, not I do. Okay, it's an ongoing situation here. And the next part is a unity, that we grow together. When we ask the Lord into our... our I've been a Christian for already over 40 years. Am I the same person now that I was when I asked Jesus into my heart? No, I've learned and grown through a lot of things. And that's exactly how it is with marriage. We're not the same people that we were when we got married. As time goes on, life changes. And we've got to grow. And we've got to adapt. And we've got to, we've got to do things to continue to make our marriage better. Marilee and I got married on this stage. Some of you were here. Now, there was kind of a dilemma for us when we got married because we come from a family of pastors. We have pastors all around us. And so, you know, who are we going to have marry us? And finally, one day I went, I know the vows. I'll marry ourselves. And I remember Marilee going, can you do that? I said, sure, just follow me. But here's the deal. When we get to the part... Uh, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, I'm going to say for better and better, richer and richer, in health and in health. Because we'd already done all that other stuff in our lives, okay? And so we get to that point, and even though we had rehearsed it, Marilee starts laughing like she's never heard this before. And she's just up here busting out. I, I get through, and I, I look at the church, and I go, you know, we've already done all this other stuff. I say, okay, 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 we'll do it right. For better, for worse, for richer, or poor. it's a part of life, isn't it? All of these things in life. There was a bride, and she was so scared to death to be in front of people. At the rehearsal, she was, she was just going, I'm terrified. I, I, I'm not sure that I can go through with it, not because I don't love him, but I'm just terrified to be up in front of people. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. And so the pastor very gently said to her, okay, when the doors swing open, just focus on the aisle. You know, just keep your eyes down there. Take a step at a time. As you, as you get a little bit farther down, look up at the altar that's up at the front. And when you get a little bit closer yet, Look at him, who you're going to spend the rest of your life. And so all the way down the aisle, she was going, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. You see, my friends, unfortunately, we can have these fights, right? Now, husbands... You have one rule. Does anyone know what it is? That is pitiful. <laughs> Husbands, what's your one rule? Love your wife. <laughs> it's love your wife. All right? If you're a spouse and you're here with your spouse, men, I want you to look at your wives right now. <laughs> look at your wife. Some of you haven't looked each other in the eyes for you. Wives, you got to look back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Husbands and wives, look at each other right now. All right? Everybody looking? Some of you still aren't looking at each other. You're married to each other, for goodness. You need to be. I'm going to sit down. I, 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 you, you, okay, are we back to it? All right. Husbands, look at your wives. Look at your wife in the eyes lovingly and say, I love you. 
you may kiss the bride. <laughs> Wives get one rule. It's to submit to your husbands. Now, first of all, in the book of Ephesians, it says to submit to one another in reverence to Christ. How many of you figured out that stubbornness is a problem in marriage, okay? We're both stubborn people, right? Okay? So stubbornness is one of the huge problems in marriage. And the Bible says, husbands, don't be embittered against your wife. And again, ladies, why does God say for the wife to respect her husband? Because I, I want to tell you something. If you're treating your husband as an imbecile and a child... It's going to deflate him. Ladies, I'm going to give you a hot tip how to get more Christmas and birthday gifts. All right? Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. Whenever your husband buys you anything, instead of going, what did you buy me that for? <laughs> okay? I guarantee you, you do that, you will get less gifts. Because men will not go where they don't think they can succeed. All right? So, I don't care whether you like it or not. He thought about you. Okay, so you're small and he got you a triple X size. It, 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 that's not the point. He probably liked the color of it, you know? I know two men in this church who gave their wives Valentine's card that on the inside said, to the man I love. <laughs> because they liked the picture. <laughs> Understand something about men. They don't actually read. You can't expect them to look at a tag. They saw it on the mannequin and they picked one up, all right? So this is how it works, but ladies, Thank the Lord that he thought about it. He did something. That's an accomplishment, right? So do I have a vow from every woman here, regardless of what they get for Christmas, they're going to thank their husbands for it? Well, it doesn't sound like any of you want presents. <laughs> I, I know women. They like presents. They should be a lot more enthusiastic. You're going to be thankful for whatever your husband gets you, Right? <laughs> So you know what that means? All the husbands here, you, you don't have to panic like you normally do. And again, men are different. Because, you know, look how a woman looks in the mirror. I mean, what do you see looking there that long? <laughs> and seriously, you have to have a magnifying mirror that has a light on it? you know, and you study it for hours, you're beautiful, stop. Okay, we're men. I'm not sure I looked in the mirror today, but if I did for three seconds, what's not to love? <laughs> I, it's great. You know, and that, seriously, that's how men are. It's so simple being a man. A woman, oh my gosh, this shoe or this shoe? They both look great. No, you got to tell me which one. That one. No, it was the other one. Yeah, I, it's, it's like, it's confusing being a woman. Very confusing. But for a man, it's very simple. But again, God has placed things as an order because here's the thing. We grow together. And here's the amazing thing. A man and a woman getting married, loving each other, it just works. And you know what's going to happen? A baby. <laughs> because you know why? A woman represents God, as only a woman can do. And a man represents God, as only a man can do. And guess what? A child grows up with a balance in his life, a balanced picture of God. That's the perfect world. 
We don't live in a perfect world, do we? Before I start talking about divorce, I want to pray for everyone who's been divorced. I want to pray for everyone that's a child of a divorce. Because when a couple gets married, a miracle takes place. Jesus says, and the two shall become one flesh, right? And so any divorce, regardless of the circumstances of that divorce, are a ripping apart. And for kids then, it's like being cut in two. Because is mom always going to be mom? Is dad always going to be dad? It it gets so confusing in life. Trust me, I'm a pastor. I've officiated at many weddings. Do you know how hard it can be at some weddings? It's supposed to be the happiest day of the bride and groom, but both sets of parents are divorced and remarried, and they're not speaking to one another, and they're fighting with one another and getting all upset at who sits on the front row in the front seat, who sits here, where are they going to sit, all these things. And one of the things I always say for every happy day, this is Sabbath day. Because guess what? Somebody's not going to be there on Christmas. Guess what? Somebody's not going to be there on their birthday. It's just, it's just hard. And I want to pray for everyone. I know you have a broken heart. But I want to tell you something. You cannot let bitterness take root in your life. Because if you do, it will not destroy that person you're bitter against. Do you understand that, my friends? It will not change that person whatsoever. But the Bible says a root of bitterness defiles many. So you know who gets hurt? Those that you love the most. They're the ones that get hurt the most. And I want to tell you, there's a great way to get past bitterness. You know what it is? Lord, I forgive. And the great news is, you don't have to feel like it. The Bible never says, you have to feel like forgiving. It says, just do it. So let's just do it. We'll practice. Then you can do it all by yourself, out loud. Lord, I forgive. Again, Lord, I forgive. Because bitterness is a prison that is a cruel taskmaster. And you are letting that other person, by bitterness, still ruin your life. Take the key that Jesus gives you and unlock that prison door and don't let that person have power over you anymore. Lord, I forgive. And as often as that ugly head of bitterness comes up, that's how often that you have to say it. Now Jesus goes on to say this. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this same manner. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Now, again, adultery is one of the ways that Jesus said that you can get out of a marriage. All right? It's one of the ways. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to. And again, if you're here today and you've experienced that in your life, my friends, do not let, if you've made a decision to stay together, then do not let that past keep you from moving on. And do not, every time there's a fight, go back to that place. Can that person change it? And, and this is why I think there's an out for it. If you can't get over it, you're better off moving on. And if you choose to get over it, then get over it. And do not, every time there's a fight, bring that back up because it can never be changed. Is that the truth? And so there are ways of that. Now, is that the only way a divorce is permissible? No, the Bible says if you're married to an unbeliever and they want to leave, let them leave. You're free in that situation. It doesn't mean, again, that if you're married to an unbeliever, you have to leave them. Many are one to the Lord by that. You've got to be led by the Lord in this. There's something else. Your husband's beating you. Is that okay? He can beat you to a pulp every day and you have to stay married to him? Absolutely not. Again, my friends, 
We have to put the entirety of the scriptures in context here. And they come back to this. Let's say you, you, you got divorced, not for adultery, and you married someone else. Does that mean forever you're an adulterer? That is divorce the impardonable sin? And the answer is, no, it isn't. The Bible tells us he forgives us of all our sin. In 1 John chapter 8, or chapter 1, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says, but if we walk in the light, in verse number 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, including a divorce. And so I want to pray for all of those who have had that pain in their life. Maybe you're a child here. Maybe you're a spouse here. But I have great news for you. The opening message of God by Jesus when he began his ministry is come to heal the broken and hearted. The Lord knows your broken heart. And he knows the pain of your children. And Jesus is the one and the only one who can heal it all. Can I hear an amen? So Lord, I pray for every person here that has experienced a divorce. I pray for every child here. And there is a pain involved that is is just there. But I pray, Lord, you would heal their hearts and not let anything in our lives that has happened to us hinder us from going on. And I pray for every single person here, regardless of what has happened to them, that they can let go of bitterness and unforgiveness in their heart and move forward with the power and the liberation of forgiving those that have sinned against them. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said. Now, it goes on, in, 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 and so he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So the fact is, yep, Divorce is a sin, God forgives sin, and we move forward from there. Now he goes into children. And then they brought the young child to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, my friends, Jesus loves children. So where does that put children's ministry in our midst? A children's ministry should be a priority in our midst. And the Lord began really speaking to my heart about a year ago. I want our children's ministry to be the absolute best of anywhere around. And we need to invest in it. We need to give them the tools and the buildings and things that they need to be able to make it work because there is no place in our entire church ministry where more people are going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ than in children's ministry. Can I hear an amen? And so, my friends, it's awesome to be able to be a part of this. But I want to tell you, and I'm going to be honest, I need some help. I... I have a vision for what needs to be done. I have volunteers who are willing to come along and do it, but I need someone to come alongside because I just, I don't even have time to get together with the volunteers. Week goes by, week goes by, week goes by, week goes by, and I don't. I need somebody who knows what to do, who has time. Maybe they're retired. They have skills in this area to come up and say, you know what, Pastor, I'll do that for you. I'll organize it. I'll make it flow together. Again, we have people that are are willing to help. But let's all pray and support our children's ministry in giving them the best that we can possibly give. Amen? Because it's a power. It's a power of raising up that next generation. Now, the disciples tried to stop the children from coming to Jesus. 
And, and Jesus rebuked the disciples. And then he said, let the little children come to me. He took them up in his arms and he began to pray for them. Is that not awesome? This is where we get our, our tradition of, of dedicating our children. Jesus was dedicated when he was a child. Jesus dedicated children. So if you have a baby, a young child, maybe you've never dedicated your children. I don't care what age they are. Call the office and we'll set it up. It's fun. We have you come up on stage. We sing Jesus loves you. We pray for the children. And then we give you a certificate. So it makes great pictures. It's an awesome thing. But is it important that we bless our children? My friends, that's key in all of our life as we go through. Now, my friends, here's the deal. The Lord wants us all to be a part. They, we can't do even of the things that I shared this week that God's done. We can't do this by ourselves, can we? But this is why he's made a church. That here at home... We're ministering, we're doing things, we're reaching our community, our children, our young people. We're pouring out our, our hearts and lives to them. To children that there are around the world, like in our orphanage in Malawi that we may never see, we're giving them a future and a hope. And now as we move forward with Calvary Bible Institute and we're raising up the next generation, amazingly, it's just happening. It's like swirling around that it's so amazing. This week we're going to have two more CBIs. I mean, is that not incredible? Last week we had another one. You know, it's like God's doing something that's bigger than all of us could ever dream or imagine. And this is where every single one of us get to be a part. Because we all have time, the same amount of time, and we should be giving it to the Lord. We all have talents. Let's be using those for the Lord, and we all have money. And my friends, I want to tell you something. I'm getting older now, and there's one thing that I'm realizing over and over again. I brought nothing into this world, and I'm going to take nothing out. And so that means with what God has given me, I better be investing all of these things in the kingdom of heaven because there's an eternal reward there. Last week we saw we're even giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. There is an eternal reward for that. My friends, what about giving 100 bucks to Sudan? Is there an eternal reward in that? What about giving to the church offering? What about helping with my time? Today, I can go help at the thrift store. I can volunteer my time. I've got time. I can do that. It's going to put money in the church coffers. So there's all kinds of ways. I can cook. I can help minister to a family this Saturday. All kinds of things. But here's where we are today. I don't want you to just be a hearer of the word. Shall we change the world for Jesus Christ? Let's all stand together. And you don't have to pray this. In fact, I don't want you to pray it unless you mean it. But are you willing to put Jesus Christ first in your life? And ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? How can I be a part? I don't want to be a, partic or a spectator. I want to be a participant. I want to be on the front lines, Lord. What do you want from me? And how can I do this? And if that's you, I'm going to pray with you. Now, if you're here today and have never asked Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, there's nothing more important than that. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah. And I open my heart to you. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. And I want to follow you with my whole heart. So fill me with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless.